Hey everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Valerie Bishida, and I'm one of the co-presidents of the Druid Hills PTO. And along with Julie Gomez, who is also here from the PTO, we put this program together for you this evening. And we have some really or great I guests. Can give this, my or... rainbow and surprise guests. <laughs> so I'd like to have them introduce themselves. And first I'd like to start with, we have two guests from Georgia Piedmont Technical College which is one of the schools where students can go to for dual enrollment and do. So um, if they'd like to go first. Great. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Pollard and I am the uh, Director of Admissions and Recruitment at Georgia Piedmont Technical College. Kristen? Hi, good evening. My name is Kristen Corkill. I'm the Director of High School Initiatives with uh, Georgia Piedmont. Glad to be here tonight. And then we have um, some people from Druid Hills, of course. Carla, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm Carla Brown. I'm head counselor at Druid Hills High School. Thanks for coming. And I brought a student with me, Ohm. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Ohm. Uh, I'm a student who previously attended Druid Hills High School and uh, decided to go to Georgia State for my uh, dual enrollment college. And Tamara? Good evening. I am Tamara Ross. I am a, the math department chairperson, and I'm also the AP coordinator at Druid Hills High School. And I don't know if Dr. Smith is with us yet. Not hearing him. Okay. So we also have two students from Druid Hills who are taking AP. Um, Christopher and Mary, do you want to introduce yourselves? Um, hi, I'm Mary. I'm a junior at Druid Hills. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm also a uh, junior. Okay. Hi, I'm, yeah, I'm a junior at Druid Hills. Oh, cool. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, so we have lots of people to ask questions of. So we're just going to dive right in. We got a lot of great questions ahead of time. So we're going to dive into those. And then obviously, if you have other questions that come up or questions that didn't get you didn't get to advance, we can um, we can put those in the chat. So I think we're going to start with dual enrollment. So let me pull up the questions. And um, maybe I think it might be best to just start with some of the basics with scheduling and when can students start and what are some of the deadlines and some of those things. Um, how do you decide which school you want to attend? Maybe some of those basics, Carla, maybe to start with? Um, sure. So um, what, and I guess at, at the conclusion of what I'm going to say, it'll be a, a good kind of segue into um, what Kelly and, and Kristen would like to talk about. But on the high school level, um, so when a student decides that they would like to do dual enrollment, of course, there are there's a process. And um, a lot of it is very independent of the high school. Um, you know, our role in it is, is, is I don't want to say that it's small, but it is because, you know, to be a dual enrollment student, a successful dual enrollment student, there's some independence that comes with that. And so there's a lot of things that they have to do on their own in conjunction with the college. So I guess to give a brief kind of overview um, of the dual enrollment program, um, of course, it allows the students to attend um, one of the participating colleges um, where they are able to earn both high school and college credit um, by taking those college classes. Um, and depending on the college that they decide to go to, you know, some colleges have hybrid classes, so they could be going face to face or they can take online classes. And how it relates to their schedule at Druid Hills High School. Um, first off, you know, we do like to have the conversation. And when I say we, the counselors likes to have that conversation with the students to kind of talk about the classes that they're interested in taking over there so that we'll know how to kind of navigate their high school schedule. Um, and so then if a, if a student decides they want to take some requirements, meaning graduation requirements at the college, they're more than welcome to if the college offers those classes. Um, and then we can kind of tailor their high school schedule based upon, you know, which classes they're taking at dual enrollment. So let's say, for example, a student who is a senior 
decides that they want to take economics at the college or, you know, and economics is a senior level um, requirement for the social sciences. And so if they want to take their economics and let's say their um, senior English at the college, let's just start there. So what they'll do and, um, you know, Kelly and Kristen will, will, will chime in on that. What they'll do is, you know, they go through the process with the college and then once they uh, register for the classes at the college, what we do is we find out when their classes are offered and try to, you know, navigate whatever high school classes, if they choose to take any high school classes, because a lot of the students in, in OM can talk about that, will we'll just go straight to dual enrollment and take all of their classes at the college. But if a student wants to do some classes at the college and some classes at the high school, the counselor needs to be made aware as to um, like what time their classes are so that we can tailor their high school schedule to fit their dual enrollment schedule. So um, for example, if they're taking those two classes at the college, the minimum of classes that a student has to have to be still considered a high school student is four. So if they're taking two at dual enrollment, they have to have two at the high school. And so once we know what their dual enrollment schedule is, then we could, you know, put, let's say they have their morning classes at the college, then we can put them in a third and fourth period at the high school. Um, you know, so if a student does decide to just take a couple at the college and a couple at the high school, once they start to register for the classes, they have to keep that in mind that they're still going to need high school um, classes as well. So it, it, it is a, a joint effort. You know, we need to, the, the student needs to know if they're only taking two at the college, they need to make sure that the two that they're taking will make um, room for their high school classes. So I guess that kind of answers the scheduling piece, hopefully. Yeah, I think so. Um, we also have some questions about how does a student decide which school to attend? Um, I don't know, maybe Om, you can talk about that one a little bit. Um, yeah, so I believe there are requirements when it comes to it, and I don't really know too much about that. Um, but I chose Georgia State because I thought uh, it was a great opportunity to go. Uh, I went to the downtown campus. Uh, I really, I guess I just, I just like the college. I think there are a couple of choices, but I don't really know about the requirements when it comes to that. Um, I, you know, I can jump in a little bit about requirements. Um, so uh, there are some state level requirements depending on if you're attending through a technical college versus um, the university system. Uh, at Georgia Piedmont, for example, or if you were to go to one of our sister colleges, we look at things like um, GPA. So if a student has a 2.5 high school GPA, that exempts them from doing any kind of placement testing. Um, so that may appeal to a student who otherwise, you know, isn't comfortable or hasn't been able to take like an SAT or ACT. Um, you know, looking at other of the universities, they may have higher uh, requirements. So it, it really, you know, some of that depends on a little bit of, uh, you know, the student application um, uh, package, um, as well as some, uh, you know, their personality. Um, a student may be attracted to, um, like Oma was saying, a, a Georgia State downtown campus, because that's, uh, you know, a, um, an experience. Whereas a student coming to GPPC may be looking at a program because they want to pursue a career pathway. They want to get in, uh, into the classes that are going to prepare them for a career at the same time taking classes that would, you know, lead towards a bachelor's degree. So there's just a lot of choice out there um, in dual enrollment statewide, um, but uh, some of the basic requirements kind of overlap a little bit. Um, we're getting some questions about, well, and I'm not sure, does Georgia State require an ACT? Um, maybe Om, you can answer that, or Carla, you may know. Or uh, Kristen, I you believe, may know too. I believe they do require an ACT. Yep, I'm yes, just about I, answered it. Yeah, SAT or, or um, ACT, either or. And, and the, um, if you go to, they do have a dual enrollment page. Um, and if you go to that page, it, it tells, because the downtown campus and the perimeter campus, they have two different um, requirements in terms of test scores. Um, and they have those listed on the, let me find the website and I can type it in the chat. 
I would like to jump, jump in there as well in reference to students picking or choosing what school that they might want to look at doing, I mean, enrolling in dual enrollment. Um, that was a great question about the SAT or ACT test scores requirement. Students, I just want you to know that at the technical colleges like Georgia Piedmont Technical College, uh, SAT and ACT is not a requirement for our dual enrollment program and students can actually get involved with taking a lot of those general educational courses that Ms. Brown was talking about, humanities, your English 1101, your college algebra, your psych classes, your history classes, uh, under our what we call interdisciplinary studies pro program. We have over at the Technical College over 28 um, uh, uh, gen ed courses that are transferable to any four-year college or university that we're sex accredited, just like a Georgia State or Georgia Tech or University of Georgia. So students do have those opportunities taking those type courses at Georgia Piedmont without having that requirement for SAT or ACT. Um, and so to that point, that could be a deciding mm -hmm. um, factor for students who are trying to choose, you know, what schools they want to go to. So for example, as you know, as a rising junior, meaning they're currently a 10th grader, you may not have taken the SAT or mm -hmm. the ACT just yet. So when it's time to apply to dual enrollment and you don't have an SAT or an ACT score, then Georgia State is kind of out for you. Right. Um, and so, you know, GPTC or Georgia Piedmont Technical College could be a very great option if you wanting to start junior year um, by mm -hmm. taking dual enrollment courses, especially at this time, because the next a SAT and ACT test is not until May. Wow. And so yeah. the deadline for the application for Georgia State is May 1st, um, even though I know I've been advertising April 15th because that is our deadline, but the application deadline for Georgia State is May 1st. And if you haven't taken the SAT or ACT, um, you know, that may cause an issue for fall dual enrollment if you're looking to do that. Right. Um, Kristen, I understand. Did you have a presentation that you wanted to share with us? You know, I do have a, a quick presentation if that would help, and I'll kind of walk through some of these uh, processes and some of the expectations. I, but um, I, I'm, I'm happy to share that, or we can continue chatting with y'all. I mean, sure, go ahead. Um, good thing um, the, the share is disabled. Um, the host um, disabled uh, screen sharing. Uh, I, I see some, um, I'm sorry, I see some comments in the chat about tuition. Um, so yeah, one of the great things about dual enrollment is it, it's a state funded program. Uh, 30 credits are funded through dual enrollment um, for tuition um, and textbooks, but um, depending on the class, if you're in a science class, for example, there may be some additional She was fees supposed to remind me. Uh, but it's largely a, a free program for students. It's a great way to get started on, um, taking classes. And then depending on the program of study after those 30 credit hours, uh, there may be an opportunity for students to tap into Hope Career Grant uh, programs um, or funding, which are specific to programs that are um, those high demand, great uh, career focused programs. Um, okay, I think I'm here now. You can go ahead and, and share um, your screen, Kristen. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Pardon? Yes, we are. Oh, okay, Looks great. Good. Okay. Um, okay, um, so uh, just as a, a quick recap, so dual enrollment in Georgia is an opportunity for students to take classes in 10th through 12th grade. Um, 10th graders are eligible to start taking those career pathway classes. Those are courses that are um, career focused programs that are going to align with a high school pathway. Um, students in 11th and 12th grade are able to take classes that are um, academic in nature as well. So those English, math, history. Um, like I said, students can take classes without paying the cost of tuition or for textbooks. And every class that a student takes, whether it's an English class or a welding class, 
Um, those are going to be classes that are going to appear both on a high school and a college transcript. So it's a great way to shorten time and maximize time towards a college degree as well as your high school credentials. Now, specifically in Georgia, when we think about dual enrollment, it really comes down to funding. And so, like I mentioned, students are eligible to receive 30 credits of dual enrollment funding. Um, again, that 11th and 12th grade taking academic courses, 10th grade students are eligible for career technical education classes only. Um, and like Mrs. Brown was saying about that counselor approval and turning in your schedule, part of the process of getting that funding is having the counselor approval. So having that conversation, making sure that the classes you're taking are approved by your high school counselor, that they're meeting the requirements towards either your high school graduation or your career pathway completion. Um, so it's important that you're in touch with that, your counselor throughout the process. Students cannot repeat classes, so it's really important that when you enroll in class, whether it's a core requirement or just something you want to take as an elective for fun, that you are focused on that and understanding that it is a college course. It's going to count towards, um, or it's going to appear on your transcripts, and it's always going to appear, and it's going to count towards that funding path. Now, students do have the option of self-paying if they go beyond the 30 credit hours or if they want to take a class that's not part of dual enrollment. Students do have the option of paying out of pocket. For a college like Georgia Piedmont, that's $100 a credit hour. Um, most classes are three credits, so if you think about it in those financial terms. And all of this, um, the specifics on funding is outlined in, through Georgia Futures. So if you're not familiar yet with Georgia Futures, that's a really great resource um, for you as a, a student in Georgia, whether it be dual enrollment or looking at hope scholarships and grants, um, transferring to other colleges and universities. Um, so I'd encourage you to review the Georgia Futures website. So again, talking about dual enrollment and the benefits, of, really the main benefit of, of dual enrollment is taking classes that are going to count towards both your high school and your college requirements without paying the cost of that college tuition. Um, Mr. Pollard talked about his son transferring into to Mercer as a, as a sophomore without having to pay for those classes. So it's a great way to get us started on your, your college experience. Yeah. Um, classes are offered on a GPTC campus through GPTC online. Um, we have students who um, you know, are taking some mixture of both. So it's really, it's a great and convenient way um, and like we said, we keep saying it's saving you time towards your high school and your college completion. Where's that? So one of the things I get asked about is like, is dual enrollment really it's college? About it, dual it is. Enrollment. So dual enrollment is like, I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough uh, because there's always one or two students who at the end say, well, I didn't really need that class or I didn't know. Dual enrollment is real college and it's going to be part of your permanent high school and college records as you go through um, your academic career. It's really important that you consider that um, in any class that you enroll in, you're thinking about it as a college course. So when considering dual enrollment at Georgia Piedmont, um, we are an open access institution. We've talked about placement scores as one of the ways of, of entering into the college, as well as high school GPA. And so not having to do an um, a SAT or ACT. Um, we serve three counties, DeKalb, Newton, and Rockdale counties. We have a large and diverse student bo body that represents the community that we serve. And um, like I said, students can take classes at a GPTC campus or through GPTC online. We have agreements with all of the other technical colleges in the technical college system of Georgia that guarantees transfer of credits. We have a partnership with the university system of Georgia guaranteeing transfer of 28 of the core academic classes and additional agreements with other colleges and universities, both in state and out of state. So you can feel confident that the classes that you're taking through dual enrollment at Georgia Piedmont are going to count towards your future plans. Now at a, a college like Georgia Piedmont, um, there are a couple or three different tracks really that students are on. Um, if you've already gone through the application process, you may have seen that um, we have these three levels. Most students moment are enrolling in interdisciplinary studies, uh, an associate's degree. And that's because they have an interest in taking classes that are going to 
towards or transfer into a four-year college. Um, but we have students who have an interest in particular subjects like criminal justice or healthcare. Whatever your pathway is, there are different levels of coursework that are offered. So a TCC, specialized curriculum, some as short as one semester, and that's largely going to prepare you for a career. We also have a new TCC that's a specific just for dual enrollment students, and it's 18 credits of general education. So we have students who are graduating from high school earning these credentials at the same time. Diplomas are similar to TCCs and that they're most often in specialized programs of specific career fields, but they require more credit up to two years to complete. An associate's degree is a program that's typically designed to transfer into a four-year college or prepare you for a career. So like I referenced the interdisciplinary studies, those are students who are looking to transfer into a four-year college or university. But then we also have students who are doing a two-year program in business, and so that's preparing them for the workforce. But whatever your program of study is, that's going to guide what classes you take while you're enrolled. So if you take uh, if you signed up to do computer program, you're, you're not going to enroll in welding. If you signed up to do um, automotive, you're not going to take a cosmetology class. The programs of study are what helps us help you keep on track towards your credentials and your high school graduation progress. So for Georgia Piedmont, there are really four parts of the application process. And one is, the actual, is um, that placement. So again, if you have a student, with, if you are a student with a 2.5 high school GPA, all we need is a copy of your transcript. You do not need to do SAT or ACT scores. Um, but if you don't have that 2.5 GPA, you can submit those scores, or you can come and take a, a test called the AccuPlacer at GPTC, and that tests you in reading, writing, and math. It's done on the computer. It's free for students. And you'll know at the end of the assessment what your placement is. To apply to GPTC for the dual enrollment, you're actually going to fill out an online application for admissions through GPTC's website. Um, you can actually also do it on your phone. It's really it's a it's a great way to, to get enrolled very quickly. Because you're a high school student, we also have what's called a new student packet. And this is something that you and your parent or guardian will complete together. And these are some programs um, or, or some processes so that we hope that you together understand what it is that you're signing up for, their permission forms, they're explaining your rights, your roles, your responsibilities while enrolled in dual enrollment. Um, the third part of that, going back to Georgia Futures, Georgia Futures is the funding application done on Georgia Futures, gafutures.org, and this funding application is how your classes are paid. And it's something that, again, the student and the parent both have a responsibility for completing. And unless you plan to be a self-paced student, then there's a little bit of a different process for that. And Georgia Futures is also how your counselor is going to give you permission to take class. So after you've spoken with your school counselor, you're enrolled in the class for the semester, your school counselor is going to put in that you're taking English 1101 or welding or whatever that class is, and that's their agreement that this course is going to be approved by them and count towards your high school graduation. This is something that Georgia Futures is going to be done throughout your time in dual enrollment. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's how your classes are paid. So that was just a really a quick snapshot. If you have questions, a great way to reach us um, to set up a time to chat about dual enrollment at GPTC is through our email at dualenrollment at gptc.edu. I will try and stop sharing now. Thank you. That was really helpful to help explain how everything works. So we really appreciate that. Um, we had, I want to make sure we have time for AP. We're about 30 minutes in. So there are just one or two more questions we'll do right now, and then maybe we can switch over. So one thing, we had a couple of questions about whether Georgia Tech does dual enrollment, which I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that. And then we had another one about how to handle a student with an IEP and dual enrollment. Um, I have an answer to the Georgia Tech and the answer is yes. Um, you can actually find a, a complete list of colleges that participate in the dual enrollment 
um, program on gafutures.org. Um, so it's a it's a complete list, and and you know they're definitely not limited to um, Georgia Piedmont Technical or Georgia State. Um, we actually have a student at Albany Technical. Um, they go to um, Kennesaw. Um, you know, there's all different colleges that participate and our students do um, go to different colleges. It's just that it's more common for them to go to Georgia State or Georgia Piedmont Technical. Um, and then the other question was about IEP. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, no, there are no accommodations. Uh, well, well, accommodations uh, for. Um, yeah, actually, I can I can jump in there. Okay. Um, so we do have um, the difference at the college level is that students have to self identify. Um, so if a student has an IEP or 504 plan that's created with the high school, that's not Mrs. Brown is right. That's not information that that we know. But students can, um, and I'll, I'll put the, the contact information in the chat, register with our offices, our adaptive services offices, um, to have those kind of accommodations in place for the classroom. We have a coordinator who works with the student every semester as a liaison between the student and um, every instructor that they are taking um, and it does check-ins throughout. But really the key for um, the, the college level is self-identify and to self-identify before the start of term, services are not retroactive. Um, so it's important to have those services in place. Oh, and one last question I noticed, um, do the credits transfer, do all institutions uh, take the credits? For instance, there was a question about Georgia Tech. Do the credits from your college transfer to Georgia Tech? So um, the technical college system has an articulation agreement with the university system in Georgia. Um, so students, if you're taking those, um, their, their 28 classes, uh, basic English, math, all of the kinds of entry level courses that students have to take uh, as part of their you know, lower division classes. Yes, those transfer. Um, typically colleges require a C or better to apply towards um, a, a degree, but they're all going to show up on a transcript. Um, some of the specialized career focused programs, those are not necessarily designed to transfer into a four year college or university, um, but those 28 core academic classes, yes, they are designed to transfer into the university. Um, Oma, I'm wondering as the, from the student perspective, do you have any um, last kind of thoughts on how it benefited you or helped you or, you know, thoughts about the program? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think where it really helped me was that I had an early start in middle school. I was able to take high school credits and that helped me finish my high school career earlier, a whole year earlier. And then for dual enrollment, I didn't have to pick between coming back to high school and then going to dual enrollment. So I was able to just focus on dual enrollment. So um, there, I know this is mostly for high school students, but if you do have like kids that are a little bit younger in middle school, it would be early. Uh, I guess it'd be a great idea to start them early in the eighth grade. Um, and then when you have that flexibility, you can uh, work like a part-time job or something. And it's very helpful. Uh, the education that I received at GSU was uh, extremely great. And I don't regret taking dual enrollment. Um, really quickly, why did you choose? Because Om did his whole senior year in dual enrollment. What made you decide to to do that? Uh, I felt like it was a better idea uh, rather than taking AP classes since I was already getting the credit and I didn't have to uh, work for a credit after taking a class. So it really helped with that. And now I have all the credits for my dual enrollment classes uh, working towards my uh, uh, major. So it's, that's why I decided to do it. And it, it is helping. Thank you. Oh, my, this is Kelly. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that, that piece right there because my son did the same thing pretty much. And um, he really um, was happy about um, when he was taking the dual enrollment classes that he really didn't have to focus on taking a in the course test and hoping that he might get the uh, the cut score for college to really take a look at it. Um, he was able to take the college course and that A or B that he received, that's what he took with him to MRSA. Um, and he was extremely excited about doing that. Students, the other thing is too, 
take one if you have an opportunity take one or two one or two classes and see take an online class or take a class in person or take a hyper class um, that was valuable experience that my son received when he did the dual enrollment program that he was able to take a class online and he was able to take a class in person and one of the things that he really said I, he really found out that, hey, I know I need to be in person because the college course work online or virtual uh, calls for a very disciplined student and that type thing. So he was able to get that experience on both ends, the online coursework versus being in person. So I encourage your students, take a dive into it and take a look at it and see if it's a good fit for you and get the experience so that when you do go to college uh, or go off to school, wherever, you would know what's the best fit for you, whether virtual or in person. Also, um, if I may, um, so, you know, the conversation, I think this conversation is to expose everyone to AP and dual enrollment. It's not AP versus dual enrollment um, because you can do both. Um, you know, the state will pay up to five, you know, 15 credit hours per semester, as long as you are within the, 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 the limit of, of your dual enrollment classes. And there's no limit to how many, um, let's say, for example, let's say a student has AP classes in their high school schedule and they feel like they have the brain capacity. I know I don't, but if they had the brain capacity to actually take AP and dual enrollment classes, they can take dual enrollment classes up to 15 credits per semester, regardless of what their high school schedule looks like. So you can do both. So if you want to have the, the experience um, you know, of taking college classes and you also want to get the the benefits of taking AP classes, you can do both. It is possible. So this isn't an AP versus dual enrollment. It's just, you know, this is what dual enrollment is. This is what AP is. And you can do both if you have the brain capacity and I don't, but good luck. <laughs> well, I think that's a perfect transition into AP. And um, Tamara, do you wanna talk a little bit about AP? We have a lot of questions about that too. Um, I don't know if there was just kind of a basic overview you want to give before we launch into some of those. Sure, I can do that. And um, I can also answer questions about IB because I also uh, teach IB as well. So uh, I do, I kind of dabble everywhere. Um, so uh, the advanced placement courses or AP as they're abbreviated are sponsored by College Board. And if you've heard of the SAT and the PSAT, they are resp responsible for College Board as well. Um, AP is a program to allow students to potentially receive college credit take, while still taking courses in high school. Now, how this differs from dual enrollment is that your courses are taught by actual high school teachers. There's a certification program that, um, that we all attend as AP teachers, and that gives us the ability to actually teach the course. Uh, students then take the test in the spring. Um, they are coming up in May and um, they are rated on a scale of one to five. Now with that rating, there is no guarantee that the college you choose to attend will take your AP scores. For example, we had a student last year who enrolled in four AP classes, but the college that she chose didn't take AP credit. So she took the courses, but her taking the exams really didn't serve a point because she wouldn't get credit for those courses. Um, AP exams do have a fee. Right now, the state pays for um, exams in the, in the STEM field, science, uh, engineering, math, uh, any of those technology courses, uh, I can't think of and I teach it. Uh, and DeKalb County this year is paying for one course for uh, every student. So uh, this year exams were $98. I probably anticipate them going up even more. So uh, there is a fee for AP exams. The plus side to AP is like I said, that you have the advantage of it being taught by a teacher in the high school. About 90% of our AP courses are year long. We do offer some that are only a semester and we have finally got our schedule tweaked to, the, to where those one semester courses are in the spring right before the exam. Um, AP is extremely rigorous. It is not your regular, run of the mill high school accelerated course, you are doing college level work 
at the high school level. So uh, that's one thing I remind my students that don't expect that what you do in a regular economics class that will translate over to an AP economics class. So what you do in a regular world history class translates over to the exact same thing in AP world because AP goes more in depth. It allows you that uh, ability to do collegiate thinking um, and collegiate level work, but still at the high school level. Um, we had a couple of questions about um, how many AP courses should someone take for college acceptance. And I know that varies from college to college, but um, more selective ones, for example, I know um, UGA talks a lot about academic rigor and that kind of thing. So what does that mean? Um, and, and it just means about, um, when you think about academic rigor, colleges like UGA, they love to see you take the classes, the AP classes, the IB classes, the accelerated. But at the same time, you don't want to overload yourself because you can overload yourself and not do well in the classes. Now, it'll look on your transcript, oh, this person attempted, you know, AP calculus and AP war history and AP US history, but you didn't fare as well as you may have wanted to versus doing maybe dual enrollment and doing well, or maybe taking a select, a, a fewer amount of AP courses and excelling in those. For example, I am a straight math person. Do not ask me to take anything AP that requires uh, history or, or writing, that's not me. So in high school, I would have taken AP calculus or AP statistics because those were my stronger areas. AP English, that was not necessarily a strength for me. So I wouldn't take that course because even though it's another AP credit on my transcript, I wouldn't do as well as I would on a in an AP math course. Does that if that makes sense? It does. And also, um, you know, Ms. Ross brings up a good point. Um, and, and also a benefit to taking AP classes is that you can piece a meal, you can pick and choose which classes you would, you would like to take at that, um, at that level. Uh, but what I will say is that all of the, the more selective colleges, or actually all colleges, um, receive the school profile. And so they know how many AP classes we offer. And if you are looking to go to um, a selective college, a more competitive college, they do want to make sure that a student has exhausted the rigor that's offered at that, that, that high school. I mean, just to be honest. Um, and, and yes, it's best if you've exhausted the rigor and has have performed well in those classes, you know, so um, but yeah, they, they, if you're looking to get into a more competitive school, um, and you're not in the IB program and you're taking AP classes, they do know that how many AP classes we offer and they want to make sure that you challenged yourself in high school enough that you've almost exhausted that, that option. And that's just being honest. And how many classes does Druid Hills offer remind us all? Cause it's a lot. Was it 13? 13, but we also are, um, Druid Hills offers 13, Fernbank offers some as well. And we actually have students who are taking exams and um, they're doing an independent study and they are taking the exam for themselves um, in May without actually taking the class. Yes, and we were asked to remind everybody that Fernbank does offer them as well, the Science Center that is. <laughs> um, let me see what else we've got going here. Um, there was some question about scheduling um, that sometimes they seem to conflict with each other. Um, with the AP and the IB? Um, I think with the AP, I, the, da, 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 they conflict with each other. Just it mentions AP classes. Several um, are slotted for the same period. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> So if you know Druid Hills, you know we run, we literally run three schedules. We have an AB schedule for AP and IB. We have a uh, block schedule. And then uh, actually IB, the second half of the day is a modified block. So uh, the scheduling can get confusing. A lot of the times they do run into each other and it's impossible to be able to get a class. But um, Ms. Brown, correct me if I'm wrong, they're also able to take AP classes through Georgia Virtual, correct? You are correct. Um, and yes, Georgia Virtual, they have a ton of AP classes as well. Of course, it's online. Um, so that, you know, kind of runs, a, uh, it could create a kink in, in someone's 
um, decision in terms of, you know, taking it online, an AP class online. But yeah, there are schedule issues, scheduling issues based upon the teach, teach the AP classes. Um, just like Ms. Ross, she teaches AP and IB, and we can't have her in two, three places at the same time. So that way that, you know, in knowing that we can only run that class at a certain time. You know, so it does create issues, um, scheduling issues, and yeah. I'm wondering, we have a couple AP students with us this evening. Um, anything you would like to add about your AP classes? If you like them, what you like about them? Um, actually, I know you guys were talking about how the schedule was like, really complicated for teachers and everyone, who, our counselors who have to work that out. But um, as someone who's in like multiple ABs, APs with an A day and a B day, I feel like it works out really well for me because it gives me like a little extra time to do my work and everything. So I really like our school schedule when it comes to APs um, and yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've pretty much exhausted all the questions. If anyone else has anything for anybody, any of our panel members on AP or dual enrollment. Hi, I sent, I think I sent a message solely to Ms. Ross. I'm a parent of a freshman, but I had a question just checking out the course catalog regarding ELA. It looks like there are two AP classes listed, at least on the version of the course catalog that I have. Right. For junior year and senior year, there, there's an, there's an AP class for both, um, but only an AP test offered at the end of the senior year class. Uh, would you mind discussing a little as to how that's structured and if they, if there are a combination course that you have to take both uh, it, again just discuss yeah, the fact sure. that those are two please there are actually two tests um junior year you take a AP, uh, ap english language and that's a separate test um that they take their junior year and then there's english literature their senior year so there are there are exams for each course and they are offered junior and senior year um Typically, students who are going to take AP literature their junior year make that decision probably about freshman or sophomore year so they can get into an accelerated course. Uh, now, let me make this point because I've gotten several emails, uh, mostly from freshman parents who are new to the process. Accelerated and AP are not the same thing. Accelerated right. um, means in, in the math course, it means that you're working at a, at a harder level, not necessarily higher level. The course is rigorous but not collegiate level um so as a freshman we only offer one ap course and that's the ap human geography just to get students introduced to the process and then that leads them into sophomore year and to being able to take more classes but there are two uh two english exams there's language offered junior year and literature offered senior year Thank you. Yeah, because for whatever reason, I may have overlooked it. It just didn't seem in the course description for the junior year course that there was a test associated with that particular class. So that's why I was a little confused, but thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and also to be clear, um, because I had a student who, you know how high school students know everything, right? Um, sorry, Marion and Chris, but <laughs> <laughs> she came up to me and she was talking about her AP class and how she wasn't gonna get the grade for the class or the weighted grade for the class because she was thinking about not taking the AP exam. And so to be clear, the AP exam and the AP class are two separate things. So you have the AP class, which, you know, that's when you do all the work, <laughs> you, you know, you do the material, you get the grades and whatever grade you earn in the class, has nothing to do with the AP exam. The AP exam is an option. 
you know, just like Ms. Ross is saying, it costs. So you may not even want to spend $98 if you know that you're not going to get a four or five on the exam. Because the reason you would want to take the exam is to try to get that college credit or get a score that will qualify you for, or, you know, for college credit. And so you definitely want to, you know, we want you to take the AP exam, but they're two separate things. You know, you do well in the class, you do well on the exam, whatever you get on the exam has no bearing or weight on the grade that you earn in the class. So I will go back to the, the course description and, you know, at least type that in there. I didn't realize it, you know, had anything about the AP exam on there, but they are different, they're separate. Um, so the class itself is the class itself. The AP exam is the exam itself. Of course, the class is pr to prepare you for the exam, um, but they don't they don't coexist. And and let me add to that what Ms. Brown saying. So College Board is changing that has changed their process since I started uh, the 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 um, AP coordinated position. And they wanna encourage more students to take the exams. So for our year long courses and for our fall courses, they, you have to make a decision by, December, by November. Unfortunately, once that decision is made and I've ordered that test, we can't cancel it and we'd have to pay for it. That is one of the downsides to taking the AP exam. So I'm constantly telling teachers, if you have a student and it's October and they're feeling like, hey, maybe this is not for me. I want to take the class, but I'm not confident about the exam. Let me know, you know, let's make that decision now because once we order those exams, we get, for lack of a better word, penalized if a student does not show or decides after the registration date that, oh, I don't want to take that exam. So it's something to think about with your students. Um, a lot of kids like the, the AP, oh, I'm in AP, I'm, I'm in AP, but they're not ready for the course load. They're not ready for the workload. They're not ready for the rigor, for the writing. Um, for many students, this is their first time not making an A on an assignment. And it really, it's like, it's like a shock to them. Like I always make A's and they're, they, that's all they expect. And it, it puts unnecessary pressure. They put unnecessary pressure on themselves. So it's just something to think about that as we start, get ready to start, um, well, we've done scheduling for next year, but you know, while this summer, but we still have the option to make schedule changes to think about, do I wanna take the AP course just to get the experience or do I wanna take the course and try for the credit? Um, when I was in high school, I took the AP biology course and I took the exam. Um, I didn't do well in the exam, but that was my own fault. But when I got to college, I had about 90% of the information I needed for a entry level biology class. So I did well. So that AP experience worked well for me, even though I didn't get the credit on the exam, I still had the foundational knowledge, how to handle a college level course, what the expectations were and how to actually do well in class. And I learned that while I was in high school. Um, we had a question come in about, um, and I'm sure you've never had this one before, Tamara, about AP versus IB or and IB, which is like, what's the difference um, in terms of perception by colleges? Perception by colleges, that's that's a pretty tough one. And again, it varies by college. It, it literally varies by college. I can tell you scheduling wise, AP gives allows you more flexibility. Once a student is in IB, their junior and senior years are rigid. They, their schedule is locked. They take the same courses with the same people all day, every day for the next two years. Um, AP, you can, it's, it's a la carte. I want to only focus in math. I only want to focus in the humanities. Uh, with, a, with IB, you have to go into every area. And again, it depends on, on the institution, how they weigh AP versus IB. But like Ms. Brown said, the colleges get a report of what we offer and they wanna know, did you you know, exhaust your means when it comes to taking rigorous courses? So- oh, Yeah, so um, Valerie, we had that, um, the presentation, I forget when it was, but it was the AP versus IB or whatever, mm -hmm. the uh, whatever it was called, but essential. And then we had representation from both. And so I had a student who actually was on the panel and she had to decide between AP and IB. And of course she did want to get into a competitive college, um, but her um, decision was based upon what she wanted her high school experience to be like. 
you know, definitely both provide the rigor that's needed um, for one to get into a competitive college, but then two, to also prepare them for college, you know, AP and IB have both. And so when you are going to decide between the two, it, de it depends on um, what you want your high school experience to be like. So just like Ms. Ross was saying, IB is very, very strict in terms of which classes you've taken because you have a set schedule junior year. All the students, all the juniors in IB have the exact same schedule with very little variation in terms of their elective, their math, and um, science, and that's it. But it's the exact same, boom, 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 boom. Senior year, exact same, except for they'll have room to pick up an elective or two outside of the IB program. Whereas with AP, we offer 13 AP classes. You can pick and choose which classes you would like to take at that level. And, and also you can take other classes outside of AP. So you don't have to take um, you know, you can take that 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 art class that you're interested in taking, you know, and and not be stuck to a, a particular schedule. So it, it for some students, it just makes their high school experience, um, you know, what they want it to be, because you can tailor it when you're doing AP. And IB is a great program, too, because you're you know, you're definitely getting the rigor that's expected of you at that competitive level. Um, but one thing to note is that if you do choose the AP, that taking two AP classes at a high school that offers 13 is not going to be enough to get into that competitive college. So it's, you know, that's maybe the, the biggest difference is the number of AP classes versus the IB program as opposed to AB, AP versus IB. You know, you don't just take one AP class and then say, yeah, I can get into that. No, that's not how it works. But definitely, if you are planning on taking, um, you know, or trying to exhaust the AP options, um, and then you try to compare that to the IB program, then they they are kind of on the same level if you are um, successful. Um, and when I say successful, I mean, to be honest, you have to be, you have to earn A's and B's, more A's than B's in those AP classes if you're looking to get into a competitive college. Yeah, I can speak to that from experience. My older son is at UGA now and he took, I think six or seven classes and um, Christopher and Mary are on, and I think June, I think how many are you all planning to take AP classes? Um, I've, I'm on my six right now and I'm probably gonna take two more, I think. By yeah, year. by next year, I think I'll have like around eight, maybe. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I think they're looking for, you know, they're definitely looking forward to what Carla was saying, quite a few. Um, but from what we were told, as long as it looks like you're challenging yourself, it doesn't, it's not so much which one you do as long as you're challenging, you're challenging yourself. And you need to make sure it's what the student is really into because if, you know, IB and AP are different and they have to pick what is they're gonna be most successful at too. So, and not, not one is for everybody. Some kids IB they're not gonna like and some kids are gonna love it. And we had students on there, some of them just loved it, loved it. And some of them just wanted to have that, that individual choice like we were talking about. So it really depends on your student too. So don't sweat it. I mean, either one is great and dual enrollment is great too. I mean, these are all great options. We're really lucky the school has so many great options. So. Um, make sure you take your student into consideration when you're thinking about it too, because whatever they do, it's going to be fine. As having been through one, <laughs> getting through two. Um, so um, I can assure you that it will be fine. Um, okay, so I, let me see. D okay, so we have a question here. Would you say that dual enrollment classes will be comparable with AP classes? As far as competitive college admissions. Ms. Brown, I'll let you answer that one. Um, so this comes straight from our post-secondary specialist, and I knew I was going to get asked this question. <laughs> so our post-secondary specialist, Ms. Brandy Beavers, if you haven't had an opportunity to um, meet her or work with her, um, um, you know, do so, please. But I asked her, I said, we're doing this panel. I know it's going to come up. What say you? 
Um, and so what she said, and this is this is her working in conjunction with admissions um, counselors from um, these competitive colleges. What they've told her is that they like to see that the students have exhausted all of the high school options. Um, so just how I mentioned, you can do both AP and dual enrollment and get that experience. But when she's talking about in terms of, you know, uh, your, your college application to these competitive colleges, they want to make sure that student has taken and exhausted all of the high school options. So for example, if a student has taken, you know, or Mary or Chris, and they've taken eight, nine AP classes, and they said, hey, I want to try some dual enrollment classes, that's, that's cool. You know, that, that would look great. Um, because of course, dual enrollment is their college classes, you know, so that college admissions officer will know, okay, not only have they, you know, taken tons of AP classes at the school, but they also wanted to get another challenge, you know, so they want to, you know, see that you've exhausted what the high school has to offer. And then if you decided to, to, to kind of go and, and delve into dual enrollment, that's great. Um, but in terms of, you know, a student who's just taken some general level classes, a couple accelerated classes, and then did full enrollment, um, when you're, when they're looking at a competitive college to go to, um, that, that application may not fare as well as a student who has taken, you know, a lot of AP options and then did dual enrollment, um, to complement that. So that was from Ms. Beavers. She told me that. <laughs> and we have a question. Are there summer dual enrollment classes available? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, so in the summer, the, the limit is um, nine credit hours, I believe, for summer. Um, and then during, yeah. during the school year, it's 15 credit hours per semester. Yeah, that's a school district rule. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Okay, well, I think we've exhausted our questions. Um, if anyone has any final thoughts or anything to share with everybody, that would be great. I have one more question about the AP psych class. Again, I'm referencing the course catalog that I have. Um, it's listed as an 11th and 12th grade class. Is that a two-year class? Or how, how is that structured, the AP site class? Um, it's actually, uh, it's a one-year class. Students actually have the option to take it 10th grade now. So they can take it 10th, 11th, or 12th grade year. But it's just one, it's just one year. Is it two semesters or just uh, one semester? We, we, have, we offer both. We offer yeah, both. We have one semester AP classes and we have a, a, a year long AP class. I'm um, excuse me, AP psychology. Class. Yes, we have both. Okay, thank you both. You're welcome. Okay, well, I um, thank you all for coming and thank you to our great panel um, teachers. Um, our group from Georgia Piedmont Technical College, our students. Um, this has been really helpful. So um, again, really appreciate it and hope you all have a good evening. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank, thank you. you, it was great. You're always great, thank you. <laughs>